Can't quit listening to it. <laughs> All right. We want to welcome everyone to the launching and sustaining powerful equity work. And uh, we have a, a pack filled hour for you. And we believe whether you are a part of launching or whether you are well on your way and sustaining that this, this uh, webinar has really been designed for you. Uh, frankly, for all of us, it's been designed for us. And so uh, we thank you for being here and uh, we look forward to sharing the time with you. I am Trudy Ariaga and I uh, bring greetings from Ventura, California to you. I'm a former superintendent. I was a superintendent of a large school district for 14 years, I retired a couple of years ago, currently the associate dean uh, at Cal Lutheran University and the Graduate School of Education. I am the very proud co-author of the books Leading Wild Female, as well as um, Opening Doors. And I, I accentuate the while. I did a workshop the other day and, and someone thought I said leading wild female. So it's not leading wild females, although that would be a good, a good third, uh, third book. It is leading wild female. And I'm also um, really the very proud team member of the Deep Equity team. Uh, we are a team of stewards and consultants and uh, people who um, care deeply about the work of equity. And so uh, I come to you with many hats on today and I'm very pleased and proud and frankly quite privileged um, to be with the team who have gathered here today. So I'd like to introduce uh, Grant Twyman and ask him to introduce himself. All right, awesome, thank you, Trudy. Uh, welcome everyone, my name is Grant Twyman. And uh, currently, I'm the Equity and Inclusion Program Manager with Clover Park School District. Um, I always like to start with uh, where I'm from. I'm originally from the East Coast, um, currently reside in the Pacific Northwest in the state of Washington. Um, but I talk about where I'm from first because uh, I feel like it, it, it's made me. Uh, born in Pennsylvania, right outside of Philadelphia. I went to school in Delaware. Um, ended up joining the Army after undergrad. Um, and so got a chance to tra travel a ton and uh, eventually landed here in the Pacific Northwest with uh, my wife and, and two kids where we've, we've made this a home away from home. Um, I've been a community guy all my life, right? In terms of building teams and supports to serve uh, the inner city urban context specifically is, uh, is kind of my background. Um, for, uh, for the military, I, uh, I deal in military intelligence which, uh, which I won't say any more about that. Um, we'll leave that there. But uh, I'm excited to be here to, to co-present with, with two people who I think are amazing um, and excited to connect with you all um, to, really, to really talk about strategy um, to, to launch and sustain work that I think um, was necessary for, for a kid like me growing up in the inner city. Um, so excited to be here. Um, looking forward to the conversation. And then uh, we got Mr. Benji Howard on the call joining us, sir. Thanks. For, I, I don't know, Grant, how do, how do you drop like that military intelligence thing and then just not expect that we're all going to have a bunch of questions for you? Yeah. But then you got to kill us or something. So we can't really ask them. Yeah, I can't. I can't answer. Not even that <laughs> question. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah. So I, my name is Benji Howard um, and uh, I have the honor and the privilege to work with both uh, Trudy within the deep equity context and districts around the country and also Grant. Um, we're working side by side in the Clover Park District where they're doing amazing work. Um, my role here is I'm the, my father is the architect of the deep equity process, the conceptual framework. Um, myself and we actually have our brother Wade Antonio Caldwell uh, joining us today as well. We co-designed the uh, youth equity stewardship, which is a a, a program to really engage youth in large equity initiatives in districts around the country. So uh, I, I get to work with all these good people and it's just good to be here. So Trudy, so glad that you're taking the lead today. I, I admire you so much and just um, looking forward to this conversation. Thank you, thank you, Benji. And again, we welcome all of you. I've been looking at the chats and see that we have uh, people represented from all over the nation. and. Uh, we just so appreciate the time that the opportunity and the time that we have to spend with all of you. Uh, Benji, J Benji recognized his father, but I'd, I'd like to recognize Gary Howard as uh, the founder of the Deep Equity Work and uh, the author of We Can't Lead Where We Won't Go. 
and uh, just really honor him for the work that he has done before us and the, the opportunity for those who are following um, to carry forward the work. And so we, we really want to thank and honor Gary Howard. All right, so here we go. Uh, what, what our intention is uh, to do today is to really speak with you about um, the unapologetic moral imperative of equity within our schools. And uh, we have 40 minutes to do that. And frankly, we could spend 40 hours, um, but it is our goal to um, provide perhaps some long-term systemic uh, roadmaps uh, for you to consider to affirm what you're already doing. And also we want to hear from you. So uh, know that if you, if you have a strategy or you have a tool or you have, um, something that the rest of us could benefit from. We, we'd love to hear from you as well. So um, please be involved in the conversation and, and we'll uh, do our best to save some time at the end to answer a couple of questions, but we'd love to see uh, what you do and hear what you do via the chat platform. Um, so as we move it forward, if I could have the next slide, please. I uh, just want to call to your attention the upcoming webinars, and you can go to www.corwin.com and um, take advantage of the incredible webinars that are up and coming on May 3rd, May 10th, and May 17th. And so we want to call that to your attention and hope that you'll take advantage again of uh, some of the uh, renowned experts in the field of education who are doing outstanding work and uh, very willing to share their time and expertise with all of you. In addition to that, next slide, please. Uh, just some Zoom keeping reminders. Isn't it funny how we have, uh, you know, we've got new words now. We've got Zoom keeping. And so the Zoom keeping reminders, we appreciate you uh, muting your mics and cameras so uh, we can have the bandwidth that we hope to have. Um, absolutely, as I said, the chat bo back box is open and we hope that you'll participate. We do want you to know that this webinar is being recorded and by attending the webinar, uh, you consent to the uh, webinar conditions and we thank you for that. But the good news is uh, because it's being recorded, you will have access to the recording and the slides afterwards. And so um, if you um, would like to continue to um, share the work or review the work, you'll have that opportunity. So thank you for the Zoom keeping reminders. All right, here we go. Uh, we're going to launch into it right now. And uh, what uh, we, we have spent a couple weeks really talking about this. And I have to tell you, it's been a great couple weeks with really rich and deep conversation uh, amongst uh, the three of us and the opportunity to really stop for a moment and think with our own expertise and the, and the hats that we wear and have worn within our districts and our communities. Um, what have been some of the strategies? What have been some of the pitfalls? Um, how have we launched? How have we sustained? And um, again, looking at some of the potential opposition. And uh, we have actually um, taken the information and into three different areas. We're going to start with self. Uh, then we're going to go very specifically to the Board of Trustees. And then we're going to go to school and district communities to include our students and our families and our parents and our staff members. Um, so we'd like to just start with self. And um, as we think about you know, launching, um, what are some of the tools and some of the strategies that we ourselves have utilized in regards to preparing ourselves for this work? And uh, I, I would say for me, the first, the first tool and the first strategy was really to clarify my own why. Um, as a superintendent of 18,000 students and uh, in a very diverse community, I had to clarify, I had to clarify my why. And this was frankly two decades ago. I was superintendent for 14 years. And I remember, I remember giving deep thought to the reasons that I believe so strongly, not that we should quote unquote do equity but that we should utilize the lens of equity in everything we already did, from purchasing, to disciplining, to planning family engagements, to uh, fundraising, whatever we were already doing, that we utilize the lens of equity. And I had to make sure that I was very strong in my commitment and my resolve with my own why. So start with your why. Um, and then 
there's always that concept of going slow to go fast. But the reality of it is that our 10th graders only get one shot at being a 10th grader. So we can't slow down too much. You know, we got to make sure that we get started. And uh, our, our advice um, as you launch is to start where you are, but get started. But start where you are and recognize where you are um, as a leader or in whatever role you have. And um, I'm going to ask Benji to just speak to the personal culture and the personal journey aspect of launching yourself. Uh, Benji, can you share what that means to you? Absolutely. I mean, it's one of the phases in the deep equity content as well as the youth equity stewardship content that that phase two, which is personal journey, personal culture, um, so critical and sometimes glossed over, I think, when we're thinking about this in a systemic way, especially from a leadership standpoint, where we want to do courageous work, we want to do great work. Um, but sometimes we forget how, <laughs> how we're in our own person is involved in this. Um, and I think sometimes we make the mistake as educational leaders that you know, I got, I kind of have to figure this all out before I roll out an initiative. Whereas really, really strong equity work and Grant can speak to this as well. Like you can Trudy that, um, the acceptance that we don't know everything is actually one of the critical pieces to this. Yeah. I don't, I don't know how to roll this out that the not knowing and the, uh, 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 uh the willingness to sort of <clears throat> acknowledge that is part of good equity work. Um, and then also understanding that my culture, like my person, like my history it is a part of my own narrative and my own why. So it, it's connected back to your first point there, Trudy, with the knowing the why is, is me, who I am. And, you know, it's also because of the dynamic where we have dominant and marginalized people in our communities that we serve um, in, in the dominant folks also have a cultural story. And I think that's so critical to understanding and when we roll these out is that, you know, for me, I'm a white guy. I mean, you may have noticed that or you may not. We don't always know these things, but I'm a white guy. I come from the country. I come from a Christian background. I was raised middle class. My parents are teachers. Um, I have a cultural story and it's, it's a valuable part of this larger story of who we are as a community. And so, um, this piece, I think, for us as leaders, when we're launching to acknowledge, one, we all have a cultural story. We have a, a an ethnicity. We have a, a, a identities that are broad and wide. And um, part of it is the acknowledgement that we don't know the whole journey. And Grant, your your uh, rollout in in um, and we know that uh, Superintendent Banner's with us today too, which is super cool. Um, you all have really kind of embrace that acknowledgement that this isn't just us as leaders putting this initiative on the community, but we're really gathering information and gathering a story of who we are culturally before we really, um, you know, basically craft an equity, uh, you know, our equity plan or equity policy. Yeah. And Grant, you have, you know, I know it's difficult to think about, are we launching or are we sustaining? Because I think we're constantly yeah. launching. You right. know, you're never like, okay, yeah. ooh, we're yeah. in this sustainability phase. Um, but I know that you have done some really incredible work with your team in your district. Can you speak to us about the staying the course and the foundational work in your self uh, work that you're doing? Yeah, for sure. And I, and I remember when we were constructing the slides, we, we kind of saw this, this self topic as kind of like a through line throughout the entire kind of like presentation or even process of organi organizational change, right? Which is kind of what you're getting at, Trudy. Um, but, uh, but in thinking about like, okay, we've, we've done some things, right? We, we've started, you know, we've kind of gone down this journey um, to, to varying degrees. Um, so what does sustaining look like? What does staying the course um, look like? Um, and I, I think it's ensuring that our work around equity and inclusion is not just like the flavor of the day, right? Which in, in different fields, we kind of have that, uh, we could have that kind of um, kind of energy around different topics like this, like this will pass, right? Um, and so if, uh, if, if I hide out long enough or just kind of wait it out, you know, give it, give it six months, give it, give it a year and it'll pass. Um, and so ensuring that we are personally and professionally committed to this journey and committed to this work. And 
And you start to recognize if you're, if you're past launching into sustaining, when folks start to come and ask you, right? Normally never directly, right? It's normally through somebody else, right? Um, hey, it's been two years. Are we, you know, kind of done with this, right? It's, uh, you know, it's, we, we've been doing this for a little bit, right? When's the next thing, right? Um, and again, it's never direct. It's usually through, through a couple of people. Um, but, uh, but it's in that moment that you start to realize like, okay, we're, we're now in the place where we need to stay the course. Um, we, uh, I, I often draw on our superintendent when he says things like equity is the core of everything that we do. Um, or another another line, right? And, and our superintendent and our school board president, they know now when they say stuff, I'm taking notes and then quoting them, right? So I remember he said, uh, equity is everybody's lift, right? The work of equity and inclusion is everybody's lift in our district, right? And so it's not just on one person. It's not something we just did at, at our back to school PD day, right? This is, this is who we are, right? Um, and so I think making that personal and professional commitment to stay the course beyond the waves of change and the momentum and the fads of, of, uh, of, uh, of what's important, equity remains that constant, um, the focused, uh, focused work on equity. And the thing about foundational work, Trudy, Trudy mentioned this. I wanna mention it again, because we, we, think it, we, think it's, we think it's really critical when you start to make the change between equity being something that you kind of learn Right. So like there's a component of equity literacy, right? The concept of equity and equity being what we what we do, right? It be it's the lens by which we do everything. Right. So we talk leader development through the lens of equity, right? You talk hiring through the lens of, of, of equity or community engagement. You name the thing, right? That's when you've you've switched from launching to sustaining. When it's it's not just a study, but now it's operation operationalized. Um, so so I think those two things are huge um, when it comes to sustaining, sustaining this work. And then of course there's there's opposition, right? There, there there's resistance. There's going to be hurdles. Um, and when, Trudy, any thoughts on that? Sure. When we when, you know when we spoke about the opposition and the hurdles, I mean again we could have spent the whole hour just speaking to oppositions and hurdles, but we selected to just just speak to a few um, that. Um, perhaps you can expect. And one is your own personal biases. You know, as you clarify your why, uh, that personal culture and personal journey is going to take some time and some deep thinking in regards to who, who are you as a person and who are, what are your personal biases? And, uh, you know, do you have the will and the vision uh, to confront those? And, you know, do you have do you have the will to uh, 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 work on those and, and not just recognize them, but address them? Um, as an individual. And uh, the other uh, opposition is obviously the opposition that is going to come from others. And one that I found in my superintendency was frequently questioning my intentions. You know, was this really about shutting it down the gate program, the gifted and talented program? Uh, was this really about, uh, you know, my personal liberal agenda? Um, questioning my intentions. And so I had to be prepared for that. I had to be able to respond to that in a way that um, did not did not put me on the defense, um, but a way that put me in the um, in the role of, of educating and articulating my why um, and my reasons behind. And you know, just like Grant, I had the you know, are you kidding me? We're going to do this again this year, and you know, we were cautious about dividing this into three separate areas because we don't want anyone to think that this is linear, that you get yourself yeah. done and then you go to the board and then you get the district and you're good to go. It is circular throughout and it is always going back to self. Um, I, I can absolutely say in my 14 years as superintendent, it was always going back to who am I? And you know what are my biases and what are my intentions? So it's uh, as you move it forward with others, it's, it's always going back. And, you know, another um, question that I got in regard to my attentions was, uh, gosh, you know, um, that's the way it's always been. You're messing with the prom. That's the way it's always been. I think mm -hmm. a, a response as equity stewards is a quick, but is that the way it should always be? That's the way it's, but is that the way it should always be? As you question my intentions about changing, um, and, and, and moving forward. Is that the way it should always be? 
And then finally, the, uh, the question of, you know, aren't we going too far? Aren't we going too far? You know, now we have, now we have this, aren't we going too far? And my response to that is, I never heard that question by those who were impacted by the inequities. I only heard that question by those who were not impacted by inequities. So the response was too far for whom? Too far, obviously not for you. Uh, but, but with all due respect, this is not about you. Next slide, please. As we, again, as we move from self, but not in a linear way, as we circle it around and start to broaden who becomes a part of our um, initiatives and our um, opportunities and our vision, uh, we wanted to just give some direct time to the school board. Uh, because we recognize that school boards, uh, governing trustees are in positions um, to make very important decisions. And uh, we need them. We need our school board members to be with us as we move, as we move our, our communities and our districts forward. And so when we thought about launch, launching, um, the, the concept that came forward that we really wanted to share is that concept of building consensus through the guiding principle and the missions and the vision. And let me just say this in a way that I hope clarifies what we mean by that. Um, every district, every school community have guiding principles and it may be their vision or their mission statement. Um, but the question that we can consistently ask is do our actions reflect our values? When we say we treat all people with dignity and respect, do we really do that? Do we really mean that when we say um, all children can? Do our actions reflect our values? And that statement of we treat all people with dignity and respect doesn't come with a parenthesis after it or a comma or an except for, um, it says all. Uh, and and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna ask Grant in just a moment to speak to that word that, that uh, uh, we believe you know, perhaps is overused and perhaps is one that allows us to paint a broad brush stroke um, and, and not, uh, not pay attention to each and every one. So every time in our district when we had an issue of controversy, I would take it back with the board to what we said we believed. Okay, but here's what we say we believe, the answer is, pretty clear to me. It doesn't matter whether what you think about this or what your church thinks or what your constituents think. Here's what we as a district say we believe. And here's our answer. Our answer aligns with our belief in our value statement. Grant, speak to us about the use of language strategically and progressively. Yeah, um, a, a lot of thoughts on, on that bullet. Let me see if I can mentioned two things. Um, the first thing you had brought up all. Um, and I think that's important because we, we tend to throw all around a lot. And the reality is we probably have been doing that for a while. And I, I like to say, how are the chips falling, right? It usually doesn't fall well for everybody, right? So, so we don't, we, we say all, but it's not really impacting all. All is not really being served. Um, and equity is that critical work, right? It's that critical concept that gives us permission to be specific, right? Um, and, and it's through the work of equity, that specificity and being able to talk about specific students, specific families, specific staff members, that we truly get to serve and support all, right? Until, until that's in, in our work, all is just kind of something that we say, but it's not something that we can actually do because of, because of the results, because of the data. Equity allows us to be specific. Um, uh, I'm thinking of a, a quote, um, uh, local guy here. He says, uh, he says uh, equity practitioners, um, they don't just work with specific students. They work with all students specifically, right? Um, and, and so keep in mind, equity giving us that permission um, to, to be specific. Uh, the other piece that comes to mind with, with language is, is recognizing words. Um, words are important for sure. Um, and we have to be honest that some words are more emotionally charged than others. Um, and so when we're launching work around equity and inclusion, we have to ensure we're not using words that we're not, 
we haven't created the capacity to really understand and to really um, kind of function function with with certain levels or certain concepts, right? So I think about uh, the term anti-racist, right? Um, it's been around for for a few years, and in the last year has grown like unprecedented, like popularity um, and uh, and, and use. Now, to be honest, I'm a I'm a fan of the of the word. I'm a fan of the concept. Um, but in our in our work, right, in two years, I've used the term maybe three times um, in in actual meetings, right. And part of that is because the terms that that term is emotionally charged. So I'm gonna I'm thinking strategically. We need to build the capacity of our organization to be able to um, not just accept it, like, hey, do I like it? Do I not like it? But really understand it, really appreciate it, and function in a way that allows us to grow. Um, because again, if we're talking strategy, we're building consensus, right? And so we're not just doing the thing that we feel good about. Um, it's recognizing what we're prepared to do, right? And I think that that speaks to like some leader responsibility. Um, so I think the use of language needs to be uh, progressive um, uh, in, in, in a lot of ways. So, so those are some thoughts I have, especially when we're talking about launching. Uh, we had some conversation about equity leaders versus equity stewards. And you know, when people hear the word leader, um, the custodian, the teacher in the classroom, the paraprofessional says, oh, not talking about me. When we use the word stewards, it's just a language change. Um, it is back to what Grant said, his superintendent said, everybody lifts. You know, everybody's a part of this. Everybody's a steward. Last time I looked up the, uh, the word custodian, actually steward is one of the definitions of custodial. You know, everybody's a part of this. And so, you know, whether we talk about uh, learning loss as our students come back after a year of, of the pandemic, or do we talk about lost opportunity? You know, those, again, it's, it's, it's language and language matters so critically um, as you're launching equity and as you're assisting your school boards um, to launch equity. And again, going back to, do our actions reflect our values? Thinking of the James Baldwin quote, you know, I can't believe what you say because I see what you do. All right, we want, we want people to say, I believe what you say because I see what you do. I believe your vision statement because I see what you do. So opportunities for the board to recognize this is not a partisan issue. This is about, this is about adhering to what we say we believe. And as we look at sustainability, we're talking about centering equity within data and other initiatives. If a board can see the impact of equity on student attendance, the impact of equity on dropout and graduation rates, the impact of equity on who is in the wind ensemble on stage versus who is not. So it's not just about who's on the stage, it's about who's not on the stage. And the recognition that that foundation of equity can impact each and every one of those. Um, we talked about having champions within the organization for equity. And um, Grant, you have an example of a board champion. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm drawing on a quote from uh, Dr. Schaefer, who's our school board president. He kind of, um, I don't know if he originated the, this phrase, but I remember we were in a meeting and he said boards um, ought to be champions for equity. Right. And, 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 and the superintendent, I've watched the superintendent and the, and the school board president um, flush out this idea of the school board really owning this, this, this work of taking equity to the community. Right. Um, and seeing the community as this uh, cr creating a bridge for the community to support each and every student. Right. Which is how you, how you put it, Trudy, um, supporting each and every student uh, uh, thriving and succeeding, right? And feeling valued and seen and heard, right? And so um, if, if you're in this phase where, okay, how do we sustain this work, right? Given whatever length of time we've been in it to whatever degree, what do we need from, from our board? Uh, we need our board to champion equity, right? We need our school board to take equity and a, and a concept and in, and in operation to our community, right? So that our community understands and is willing to partner alongside the district to really support each student. Um, and again, we can say all, but I think I think we have to we have to take uh, permission to be specific here. Um. And so it becomes our role to identify and create those opportunities for board members to grow in their understanding of equity. Don't leave them out. They're critically, critically important in the work. 
Uh, and there are some political realities of the board as you start to look at, you know, okay, what would be potential opposition with board members? Well, the, the political realities are that they're elected officials. And uh, the political realities are that they have constituents that they run into in their churches, in their synagogues, in the grocery store, in the, uh, you know, wherever they are in the community. And uh, they are beholden uh, to the votes of constituents. So that's a political reality and an opposition that, that we need to be prepared for. And the more that we educate board members, the more that we create opportunities for them to understand, the better off they'll be as they respond to their constituents in the grocery stores. Um, we also have to be reminded that a potential opposition is that they are not trained in this work. They are not trained educators, so it, it becomes our job. That's our job. And also that there is fear. Fear of controversy, fear of not getting reelected, fear of votes of no confidence, fear of losing friendships, fear of losing votes next time around. And so uh, we have to recognize, recognize those as potential opposition and how we assist board members. And I go back to saying, um, I had very diverse boards in my career, but I always took it back to what we said we believed. But here's what we say we believe. And, and, and can you say that in front of your constituents? In our district, we believe this. And so, yes, we did vote on that, which may not be something that you personally um, um, adhere to or agree with, but it does adhere to with what we say we believe. And allow the board members to say, you should expect nothing less of me than to align our actions with what we tell the community we believe. Next slide, please. You know, one piece, if I could, if I could add to- Go for it, Grant. Yeah, thinking about potential opposition and kind of strategies, um, I, I think about the the reflective question is like evaluating how we respond, right? As a as a board or or a district or or even a school or an organization responds to, um, uh, I'll put it this way: the uh, the the one white parent, right? How much can the one white parent move, right? Versus the countless, right? stories and incidences of, um, uh, of, of folks coming from historically marginalized identities, right? With, with real experiences, right? Of harm and trauma, right? Um, and how much the, the one white parent can move a, a board or a department or an organization um, and evaluating how equitable, right? That is, um, and, and a lot of times, some of the things that we may hear is, uh, well, I don't hear from, you know, black and brown um, people in the community. Um, a, a, a good one is, well, well, who's, whose problem is that, right? Like th that's on the elected official, right? To, to, to work to create bridges, right? It's structures of, of communication and collaboration um, to, to ensure we are hearing from um, not just the folks that, that voted for us, right? But the community right, as, as a whole. Um, and so one of the ways, right, thinking strategically, how do we, how do we, how do we work through this? Um, it's, it's encouraging the board or creating structures of communication and dialogue for the, the broad community um, and not just um, the folks that may have uh, elected us into the position, right? Which I think that includes students who we know can't vote, right? But they represent the community. Um, and, and we have to, I think we have to be vigilant and intentional um, to put in the hard work to hear hear from folks that have been historically marginalized um, who are not who, who may not just send in the email or, or call in or dial in because the system has communicated a certain thing already right your voice doesn't matter and so it's on the folks in power to kind of create those bridges and structures of communication if we really are going to move move this work forward so so those are those are some thoughts i wanted to just add I like your term, Grant, relentless collaboration. Yeah, that that's- I, I, I feel like I've absorbed that. I'm still trying to figure out what that means. But to me, when I'm listening to you right now, it sounds like you, relentless collaboration means that from a systemic level, you are consistently, like from a systems culture, you are consistently reaching out and listening to voices that you don't agree with on one hand. And then you are consistently and relentlessly reaching out to voices that are historically marginalized. So the voices that you're not hearing as much, kind of the, the, the folks that aren't necessarily showing up to the board meeting, 
but that to me that's kind of what i've learned from you around this idea of relentless collaboration disagreement leaning into that and then really seeking out consistent the you know consistently the voices that are tend to be not heard as much in the community yeah absolutely and, and here's the thing it's it's one of those things that doesn't just flow, right? Like we are not going with the stream, you're going upstream. Um, and so it's, it's hard for a lot of reasons, but, but I think that's why we have to be uh, intentional and we have to be committed. Um, Trudy mentioned it earlier, going, going slow to go fast, right? We are for sure slowing down to speed up. Um, so, so more to say there, um, but, uh, but yeah, we can, we can jump to the next, uh, next section. So for, for this next section, we really wanted to speak um, in our very short time that we have remaining um, about district office school staff and students really looking at our school communities and uh, recognizing that the launching um, within our school and district communities, the sustainability, and again, the potential opposition. So we, we spoke earlier about equity stewardship is everyone's role. Um, we've said it in various ways. And again, looking at the language of stewardship and being reminded that, you know, oftentimes we think about um, superintendents being at the top of the pyramid when the reality of it is that the people at the top of the pyramid are those are, who are closest to the children, our paraprofessionals, our teachers, um, the folks who work uh, out, out on recess duty. Uh, equity stewardship is everyone's role. And as you think about the preparation and the launching within your district, uh, make certain that you have the right people at the table. And it's not just about having a seat at the table, it's having a voice at the table as well. Um, affirmation of the work that has been done as you're launching, making absolute certain that it never comes across as a gotcha or a you're broken and you know we're, this is going to fix us. Uh, no, it's about, you know, let's affirm the great work that we're doing. We are good people doing hard work. Let's affirm that. Um, but let's recognize that we'd be better tomorrow. We'd be better tomorrow if we continue to focus on issues of equity and utilizing a lens of equity in all that we do. Um, building trust and tone within the, within the organization. This is one of the tenets of deep equity and one that uh, we just wanted to make sure that we reiterated again, um, that the tone and trust has to be there and the opportunities for folks to set working agreements with that tone and trust and um, recognize that, you know, every voice has a right to be heard um, and um, uh, not kicking people out, but actually kicking people into the discussion. And Grant, what about leadership mattering? Um, leadership is huge. One of the things we saw um, in year one of our intentional deep dive was that schools or departments that had quote unquote struggles with equity professional development. Um, the thing that was consistent in those schools or, or those buildings or those departments, it was pre-existing staff dynamics um, or issues amongst the staff unrelated to equity, right? And so equity came in um, in terms of professional development and kind of strategic work is kind of like this spotlight on issues that already existed. And so if you weren't, if you weren't clear, you would point to equity as, hey, equity caused this, right? The work of equity focus, right? All of that caused these issues. Um, when reality, the reality was there were pre-existing conditions, so to speak. Um, and so the, the key, if you want equity to, to work in a school or department or organization, you need to develop the, the capacity within your leadership to lead well. Um, and so do you, do you wait to build leader capacity then launch the work of, of, of uh, equity and inclusion? I, I don't think so, right? Because I think to Trudy's point, right? Our 10th graders are gonna be 10th graders one time, right? So we, we need to do something now, but at the same time recognize um, it's not always the focus on equity that's causing issues. There, there, there are other dynamics and I think leadership is key. Um, and, uh, and and just to kind of kind of caveat that um, we, D developing leaders is like the, the person who is able to build consensus, influence, cast vision, um, understand their staff, and then be able to execute, right? If you have leaders that can do that well, um, equity is now not without, you know, some bumps in the road because this is complex work. This is, this is heart and mind work. This is, this is not going to be easy or, or just smooth. But if you have leaders who can actually, who, who can lead well, right, build consensus, influence, cast vision, 
they understand their staff and they can execute, um, then, then we can count on equity being able to be uh, sustained, right? Um, so I think leadership is key. Um, and, and, and I'm, I'm, of the, I'm one of the guys, maybe I'm old school, where everything rises and falls on leadership. Do we still say that? Um, I, I, I still hold to that. Leadership matters. And uh, take us into the sustainability issues. Yeah, this uh, relentless collaboration. Um, Benji kind of pinged off this earlier. I, I love it. Here, here's, here's how we think about relentless collaboration. Um, and, and I hope you are taking notes, but this is being recorded. Um, we, we've been saying a ton of, ton of things here that uh, may be hard to follow, but relentless collaboration is, is kind of like this idea. Um, we're we're going to go as, as fast um, as, our, as our slowest runner, right? So that's an aspect of relentless collaboration. And I'm drawn from um, being in the army. On Fridays, we would do these runs with our unit. Sometimes it was 100 people, sometimes 500, sometimes 3,000, right? And in some cases, the run was paced for the slowest runner. And that was intentional for that particular run, right? That particular activity to build uh, morale, right? To build a sense of uh, togetherness and cohesion, right? Um, and so when you think about the art of relentless collaboration, it's not designed to call out or point out uh, the person who's unlearned or uneducated or hasn't been in this journey for a while. So. So collaborating in a way in a space that 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 the slowest runner can feel can feel good about this, right? They can feel good about where they are and they're not just being called out. And that's different than the person running the opposite direction. That's different than the anchor in the work. Uh, that's creating this the type of community where where we all can really grow, right? And can really learn. And that's even the folks who who say the thing that isn't so polished, right? That doesn't align with equity literacy, right? Like, can you grow here, right? Can you can we all learn here? Um, that's part of relentless collaboration. And then the other piece I'll just say really quickly is, uh, is being intentional about doing that hard work, that slower work um, that gets diverse uh, voices at the table um, and folks who are normally kind of pushed to the margins because it's just too hard to talk to them. It's just too hard to make the schedule work. It's just too hard um, for whatever reason. Our, our system isn't designed for their voice. Um, relentless collaboration says we're we're going to make it work um, because their, their voice is not just important but critical for us to do this well and, and we're actually missing out when we don't have uh, diverse voices at the table um, so yeah that's a little bit about relentless collaboration you all got me amped up this morning all right but it's that consistent concept of uh, you know not just who's at the table but who's not at the table and when we speak mm -hmm. about who's at the table. We want to make sure our youth are at the table. And I'd like to ask Benji to speak to the concept of making sure our youth are at the table. Here I go. Chu, you just dropped in. I can, this is like my passion, right? The concept of stewardship itself is, you know, we, we came to that because of something that you mentioned, Trudy, around um, leadership as opposed to stewardship, that stewardship kind of we were actually, we interviewed kids and kids were telling us they weren't comfortable with, with leadership because, well, they said things like, um, it's lonely at the top. People are looking for you to fail. Uh, kids of color saying, well, that's for white kids. You know, so there's all these preconceptions about leadership and stewardship became for us something that's much more invitational and much more inclusive, which ev everybody gets to be a steward. It means that you care and that you're growing your knowledge and you're taking action based on that care and knowledge. And we've learned so much in the last decade about what kids can do in a district from a strategic standpoint, because today we're talking about strategy. And as much as I don't want to exploit kids, I don't want to put them in front of the board if they don't want to be there. I don't want them to have to feel like they, well, never mind. they're asking for it. I mean, we are living in an incredible year where public school is transforming and so much of it is because of young people they're asking for a different kind of education they're asking for their education to be relevant to who they are as human beings to their identities they're asking they don't want to just be college and career ready they're saying straight up like we need to be prepared to meet the, the environmental and social challenges of our time right that that's what we need from public education and so in the in looking at how we can get youth at the table, I think um, it's just really about 
going beyond the idea of youth voice, <laughs> right? Like, oh, we're going to listen to you because how many, I'm, oh, Grant, you know what I'm saying. Like, how many times have you sat with kids and they say, yeah, like somebody came in and they said, yeah, we want to hear the youth voice and then no one does anything. So it, it's the distance between youth voice and youth agency that we need to travel. Like, that's, that's where we need to get. And, and you know, Grant, I, I think that you are actually becoming one of my mentors in this because we've been doing this for a long time with youth, Wade, Antonio Caldwell and myself with Youth Equity Stewardship. We've been trying to get kids at the table for a long time. And it's actually very rare that we get a partnership with a district who, uh, who gets that. It's not just about having a cool experience for kids where they really connect across difference. They get to explore identity. They get to like, look at what stewardship means. How are you really contributing to the community? But no, it's more than that. It's like sitting at the table where decisions are made about specific things, about the black experience in your community, about the LGBTQ com experience in the community, about what it means to change curriculum to really reflect that so that kids feel like they're learning about them, that school is a place where I get to show up. Um, it's about looking at discipline disparities and making sure that the decisions that are made around discipline policy are informed by the kids who are disciplined, the ones who get referred to the office, right? So I think that what we're talking about here with um, youth at the table is just really that distance again between listening to young people and then doing something about it when you hear from them, you know, and we, we're seeing that across the country from Pennsylvania to Minnesota to Detroit to Kansas to Colorado to the West Coast, we're seeing districts who are courageous enough to really put that 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 means it, it's an advisory. You got to have an advisory that has a direct channel to the superintendent. Like Mr. Banner, right? You, you got to have the superintendent listening to these kids. You can't just you got to have regular meetings with the principal throughout the year, maybe eight times. Right, Grant? Get them in there eight times right. throughout the year, talk about real stuff that's happening, and then make sure that they know that when they say something, somebody's doing something about it, you know? And then the other thing I think with youth, um, you know, some people might say, well, they move through our system. So, you know, but in general, I think kids stay in districts longer than superintendents do. So you might as well capitalize on your investment there. And, and I think high school kids want to leave a legacy. And we work a lot with fourth graders and we know that fourth graders have a lot to say about what culturally responsive practice looks like. And they, they also know what it doesn't look like. And so just opening up and making sure that we're having those conversations. And when we make decisions, it's informed by our clients, I guess is kind of the bottom line with that youth at the table piece. Thank you, Benji. Thank you. And your passion, you know, we, I mean, your passion comes to. <laughs> Did I get fired up? Did you? <laughs> but we also, oh, man. <laughs> we want to recognize there's potential opposition and, and, you know, we encourage you to, uh, be prepared for that and and be ready to uh, not run from it, but uh, face it, you know, face it head on uh, potential opposition of resistance to change or just the plain old inability to recognize there's a need for change. It's back to this is the way it's always been. Is that the way it should always be as a superintendent when I could get that expulsion file in my early years. And before I opened the file, I would say to myself, Latino male. And I would open the file and 90% of the time I was right. It's time for change. It's time for change that as your superintendent, I can predict that. It's time for change when the assistant principal whispers in my ear as we walk into a classroom, this is the advanced placement class. And I whisper back, I know. And she says, oh, how did you know? Because I can see who's here and I can see who's not here. It's time for change. Uh, so the resistance to the change or, oh, my gosh, you know, this is the way it's always been. Um, it's back to that. It's not about you. And if we can show our district and our school staff and our support folks and our board of trustees um, that we have some data that reflects that it's time for change, um, then we can we can we can move or, forward um, with that barrier. Um, people will say this is yet another thing to do. We've already talked about how this is not another thing to do. This is about doing what we already do. All of the daily aspects of education with a lens of equity. It's not about doing one additional thing. And that narrow focus on standardized testing outcomes. Will this help our standardized test outcomes? 
Um, my response is yes, it will. Yes, it will. But don't be so narrow that that's the only thing you're looking for. How about the outcome of a shift in the tone and depth of adult conversation? How about the outcome of students feeling like they have more trusted adults on a campus who not only relate to them, understand them, but um, have, have had similar experiences to them based on who they are? How about the outcome of the significant reduction in educational disparities in addition to academics? Back to who's in the wind ensemble? Who's on the varsity soccer team? Who's in the drama production? Who's in the who's in the Saturday summer uh, Saturday suspension room? How about that as additional outcomes that we can look at? Next slide, please. So as we move into closing, um, if we could have the next slide, uh, we just wanted to acknowledge. We really kind of focused in on our internal groups. Uh, but we want to acknowledge also that our parents, our families, the community at large are also going to be critical in the launching and the sustainability of equity within our schools. And um, a lot of this we have, we have already spoke to. And uh, the, the one bullet that I'd like to speak to is address the fears. You know, address the fears of the parents. My child will suffer. My child will be blamed. Um, this is a liberal agenda. Um, this is, you know, this is going to expose my child to something that we don't expose them to in the home. Address those fears. Address the fears and recognize that um, uh, when, when people are willing to articulate their fears, it's the good news for us, and we can address those fears. Um, begin with assumptions such as equity is a nonpartisan issue. This is not a partisan issue. Clarify what it is and what it's not. This is not a program. This is not a program that we're going to implement. Um, when you, Grant, as you look at those bullets for parents, families, and community, and all the work that you do on a daily basis, um, which one stands out to you that you'd like to accentuate? Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll try and be quick, Trudy. Thank you. Um, I'm thinking about that first one, who's at the table, who's not at the table. Um, <clears throat> and I think in, in the context of uh, the conversation on uh, managing the pace for change, right? Um, I, I always say, if you're going to talk about change, right, in the pace of something changing, ensure that that table, right, having that conversation has people who've been impacted differently by the thing not changing, right? It's really easy to sit at the table and talk about lifting, you know, lifting something, um, right, off of somebody when the people at the table don't have the heavy thing on them, right? Because then I can talk about pace of change and I'm not that urgent, right? Because I'm not the one carrying it, right? It's not sitting on me. Um, so make sure we have people at the table um, who, who the, the heavy status quo is sitting on top of them in a way that's oppressive um, and limiting and, and harmful. Uh, make sure that they're at the table because that level of urgency is what we need and, and having a healthy and honest conversation on the pace of change. Um, so I think who's at the table is, stands out to me. And, you know, I don't know about you, but I'm not afraid to eat alone. So, you know, sometimes it's creating your own table, you know. Yeah, it's, there we go. Now that, mm -hmm. that's another webinar. You see what she did there? <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. I'm worried because Grant, Grant says he takes notes of what people say. So like, you know yeah. It. <laughs> yeah. Next slide, please. As, as we close up, we know that um, you may have questions and comments and I've been, I've been perusing the chat as we've been um, talking and just so appreciate uh, some of the uh, comments in the chat. Are there, uh, um, do we have any, uh, I think we have time probably for maybe one question. Do we have one question that uh, Corwin staff would like to uh, forward to us that um, we can address? And we got just want to acknowledge we have the wonderful Charlene, Sabrina, uh, supporting us here. Um, yeah, I'm not seeing any questions uh, so far in the chat. So if you do have any questions, please um, submit them in the chat. Oh, I see something popping up in the Q and A as well. Curious about any learnings from some of the community flare ups in response to equity efforts. Okay, let's let's take with that was one. That, was that flare ups? 
Yeah, curious about any uh, learning flare-ups. Let's take that one as we uh, before we close. Um, what were some what were some flare-ups within the community that um, we are aware of that have occurred? I I think uh, yeah I'll, I'll I'll defer to uh, to to Benji if he has anything first. Uh, I, I was going to say the same thing because I know you've dealt. So when I when I hear flare up learning flare ups, I think I'm, it almost takes me back to the language thing that you talked about, Grant. Um, you know, a lot of flare ups right now around the terminology that we're using. So yeah. part of this is really transcending the rhetoric of wokeness, uh, cancel culture, um, equity itself. Kind of is it somehow framed. There's a lot of disinformation around out there like equity is sort of about equalizing outcomes which it's it's not it's about you know we have that and that's why the language is so important we have to get straight about what this like trudy said what is this and what is it not equity is not equalizing outcomes equity is making sure that students and families get what they need so that they can be successful on their own terms right not somebody else's right. terms so th i think the flare-ups right now have a lot to do with language and disinformation about um, what this stuff is. And so I think that just, it, it calls us back to the table to really get clear about what Trudy's talking about. We got to get back to the mission and then we got to live up to that mission. And we, not, we have to make sure that our language feeds into that mission and it's about serving kids and it's not partisan. Yeah. I think, yeah. I don't um, know if that was necessarily the, um, the fear-based ideolo ideology of uh, Mr. Banner's coming in yeah, this, uh, the other Marxism stuff. I think that we have to probably be a little courageous in kind of calling nonsense, nonsense. Um, yeah, for sure. And it's, and part, part of what you're saying, Benji, is um, a lot of times folks will, the flare-ups are folks trying to frame something for you to then condemn you for it, right? And, yeah, and so- you've, you've experienced that, right? That it's like, you say something, but then they said you said something different that you never said. Right, right. Yeah. It's like, oh, so you're saying all white people are racist? Like, hold on, let's be clear. No one has said that here, right? Yeah. Um, and then if we can get to that, like, okay, no one has said that. That's coming from something else. Yeah. Then before we even deal with that, which I'm probably not going to because you framed that, I want to talk about what we're actually saying, right? And that that's where we kind of spend our time. What we actually said, not what folks are coming in trying to frame us to say. Which, which calls us to task around, it's not just about like being clear about the language, but it's also about uh, restating it over and over and right. over again. So the messaging is repeated and that we kind of start to understand this as a community, right? Right, right. And in, in the words of Gary Howard, this is about more of our students across more of their differences, achieving at a higher level, engaging at a deeper level, more of the time, and here it is, without giving up who they are, mm -hmm. without giving up who they are. Mm -hmm. So when there is, this is all about fear base and um, liberal agendas, and that's, this is what it's about. It's about more of our students being more successful more of the time without giving up who they are. Nothing partisan about that. And uh, I saw the question about what about teachers? You know, I hope that we've addressed that with teachers, that this is an opportunity for teachers to do what they do every day the good work that they do every day. But when you, when you assign that homework assignment, you're reassigning it with a lens of equity, not with an all brush, but with an each and every one, each and every one. When you do that, when you grade that paper, when you um, create that master schedule, when you plan that field trip, when you plan that fundraiser, you'll be doing that with the lens of equity. And the good news is that more of your students will be more successful across more of their differences, more of the time without giving up who they are. Can we have the next slide, please? I'm imagining, Trudy and Grant, that could, just from the questions that are coming in, that a lot of folks are wrestling with this language thing. And I think we, we yeah. want to make ourselves available to talk because there's a lot more depth of thought that mm -hmm. our team has kind of developed over the last year and really over the last few years around that. So we want to make sure that we're kind of, we will make ourselves available to be in conversation with anybody who's interested. I see Adam, you know, you're, I, I hear you're, comments and I think there's a lot more that we can talk about just specifically around that. So um, we'll make ourselves, we're, we're gonna actually share our email so you, you all can reach out. Um, 
Uh, you can get more information at, at, at uh, corwin.com forward slash deep equity. Um, Trudy's, you know, Trudy's book is, is through Corwin. So you can find her uh, leading while female book, which is amazing. And it's making a, a huge impact in districts. The deep equity uh, work is based on my father's work, which is uh, we can't lead where we won't go. It's a whole systemic change process. The youth equity stewardship is aligned with that conceptual framework. So you can find more information there about it, how to how to really get uh, young people involved in this from fourth grade to 12th grade in, in these movements and in districts. Um, so we'll make sure that you have access to that. Um, and we will be available for folks who just want to have a conversation. Um, there's our, uh, our emails for Grant, for Trudy, for myself. Um, we'd love to have a conversation with you um, anytime. And this, <laughs> this feels like it went really fast. <laughs> Trudy, thank you for your vision and your leadership around this. And thank you to Yeah, Cole. thanks, Trudy. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. But, uh, Angie, yeah. And, uh, yeah, thanks to everyone for being with us for the hour. And uh, carry on, do good work. Yeah, we're right. here if you want to talk. Thank you, Fanny, Kathleen. Appreciate you. Katie, Adam, look forward to talking to you, man. Luisa Vargas, thank you so much. Thanks.